Okay, this video is chapter 7 of the book, The Medical Reformation and Vegan Renaissance, and this chapter is about fats and oils. Um, I'll try to give a balance of how I handle the topic. I'm going to explain things enough that somebody who's new to it will understand, but I'm also going to use more you know, advanced technical terms. I kind of think that's one of the purpose of my lectures is to go into a little bit more advanced stuff. You can always watch the video more than once if this material is new to you or slow it down. Okay, so I start out showing a portrait of the Mona Lisa. You know, she's sort of a big fat lady. And also, by the way, she's a perfect example of overrated art. Okay, it's an okay painting. It's not that great. It just gets a lot of hype, all right? Leonardo da Vinci was a Mickey Mouse artist compared to Michelangelo and Raphael. He just gets a lot of, of hype, I think maybe because he's gay or something, but he's just not that great of an artist. I'm sorry. Yeah, he was very good, but there's tons of very good artists, okay? And his little notebook, you know, it's nice, but Michelangelo's the greatest of all time. Raphael's right up there, okay? How many paintings are worth a crap from da Vinci? Not many, okay? But anyways, it's basically a fat lady, if it is a lady at all. Um, and anyways, consider this like the before picture. Botticelli's picture will be our after picture. So here's the birth of Venus. You know, this is a magnificent painting. Botticelli, him and Rogier van der Veen were the two best painters of the 1400s. So it's magnificent. Um, one of the great Renaissance painting. And that whole idea of the Renaissance being sort of a rediscovery of the ancient Greeks and Romans that especially was true of Florence with the Medicis, and they had a bunch of scholars working with them who would give advice, like to Botticelli and later some of the art or art, other artists from there. But most of the Renaissance art was very, very religious, okay? This is an exception, and obviously it's a magnificent painting, The Birth of Venus, 1485, by Sandro Botticelli. Okay, now here is a drawing from... Um, idea I got from Jeff Nelson. He's the guy who runs Veg Source, you know, a great nutrition channel, and he called it the hype and bust cycle. And I talk about this because, you know, every couple of years some new thing comes in, it gets all this hype, oh, isn't it great, isn't it wonderful? And, uh, you know, it's recommended to everybody. And then a couple of years later, sometimes it takes a decade, people realize, gee, there's no real benefit. And then a couple more years go by, maybe another decade, and then they realize the thing is harmful. Okay, like you still hear some idiots saying that it's good to eat fish. Yeah, salmon's 50% protein, 50% fat, lots of sad fat. Yeah, there's some omega-3s, but who cares? You don't need to seek them out with salmon. So the joke of the picture is I start out initially having the hyped up thing with a health halo given to it by all the industry hype. Um, and then I sort of change it to the green halo. Well, at least it's from plants. Um, and then I show the halo kind of like leaves turn orange in the autumn, and then they fall off the tree to make the circle discontinuous on the periphery there. It breaks apart. All them leaves are falling. All right, it's a great song, by the way, especially Edith Piaf sings the best version of All the Leaves Are Falling. All right, and then it becomes the devil. It grows devil horns like Omega-6 cooking owls. Everybody thought they were great in the 1960s. Now we know they're terrible. They're like one of the worst things you could eat. Give you a leaky gut. They give you, uh, they damage your hunger center in your brain, the arcuate nucleus. They uh, damage your uh, hippocampus, make you stupid. Yamashiri, that guy, uh, Tetsumori Yamashimi, the Japanese neuroscientist, wrote a lot about how omega-6 cooking oils make people stupid. F-minus in the water is a big crock of BS. Hyped up for your teeth. You don't need it for your teeth. Um, it be a small, little, tiny benefit for your teeth and a significant benefit in lowering IQ, making people stupid and docile. Gee, I'm sure it's just a coincidence that's in your water. All right, and all this other stuff too. Caffeine is bogus. It just mimics acute stress. I think that's a typical BS thing. Coffee and tea are not your friends for optimal health. Um, and one other thing too, a lot of people don't know. If you just hydrate yourself and you know drink some fruit juice or something, that can energize you too. You know, drink some beet juice. That'll perk you up, and you don't get all the side effects of caffeine. Uh, nuts got tons of fat, and I'm 80 to 90 percent fat. So, anyways, I'm just showing this because right now. All this coffee, caffeine, tea, and nuts are really hyped up a lot, as well as omega-3s. You know, I've given separate lectures on all this stuff, and I'll get to it later in the book, but all this stuff is totally hyped up. Flax, I haven't even studied it, but it's almost like why bother? It's super estrogenic. It's even more estrogenic than soy, and soy causes, you know, 
damage to the reproductive tract. Uh, you know, it's a big joke if you read the old papers. And then all of these positive papers. And so once industry gets a hold of something, they know it's a billion dollar industry, they're going to hype it up. It's also good for sterilizing people, lowering sperm counts, it's damaging to the female reproductive tract. All you, you know, all the stupid proles are being sterilized and they're too stupid to realize it. Soy is an instrument of that, as well as F minus, as well as aluminum in the water, in the sky, too. Okay, we already found out what a joke cal calcium supplements are. So all this stuff's bad. So that's one of the reasons why. The only supplement I take, by the way, is methylcobalamin. Okay? So anyways, this is a good hype and bust cycle in Nelson. Anyways, that was a good one. Okay, let's see. Oh, the other thing, too, a perfect example of the hype and bust cycle was that whole story with... Um, those SSRIs, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, coming out in the 1980s, the whole psychiatry big lie about, you know, the neurotransmitter theory. Okay, we're going to increase serotonin and that's going to make your depression go away. What a crock of BS. The whole neurotransmitter theory was fake. It was never shown to be true at all. Um, and the guy who showed what really is going on is Peter Bragan, that basically almost all psychiatric drugs are a gradual chemical lobotomy. Um, Okay, so like I'm saying to you, one of the key points of this chapter is all fats are bad. <clears throat> now, what I mean by that is to seek out any dietary fat is a bad idea. I'm going to explain why that's true. I'm going to explain why I think it's stupid to seek out omega-3s. I think it's stupid um, to pursue this good fats thing. I think that's just another like slogan that gets into the mind of low IQ proles. And it tricks them and makes them stupid. And I think the purpose of soy is to sterilize all the, you know, the stupid proles. Okay. The only good fat is dietary fiber. And so I get, I get comments from viewers saying, oh, you know, aren't you stupid saying fiber's a fat? Yes, there's a good reason why I say fiber's a fat because some of the dietary fiber is converted by the good bacteria in your colon into short chain fatty acids. And in particular, the four carbon one butyrate is what maintains the gut lining and prevents leaky gut and all the problems associated with that. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna go through just a little bit of chemistry here to um, Makes sense of, uh, let me get my picture out of the way here, of uh, the, so when you have a chemistry molecule that's just carbons and hydrogens, that's called an alkane. And so one carbon with the hydrogens, that's a methane. Um, if you take this methane and you attach it to something else, so now it'll be the carbon to the three and then this will be what it attaches, then it becomes a methyl group. These things are worth knowing here because you're going to hear them all the time in chemistry. These are like the basic building blocks of making organic molecules. Organic molecules are molecules that contain carbon in them. Okay, ethane, when you've got two carbons. And then the way you make them into stuff is if you add an alcohol group, OH is an alcohol group, it's also called a hydroxyl group. So if you have a methyl group and you add an alcohol to it, you get methanol. See how these names make sense? If you have an ethane, you add an alcohol group, you get ethanol, so that's drinking alcohol. Methanol is like wood alcohol, it causes brain damage too. Okay. So here's propane, three carbons, propane. If you add an alcohol to it, you get propanol, all right? And the big thing to know about that is if you add three alcohol groups to it, so it's propane, tri, tri as in three, all, three alcohol groups, propane, triol, that's glycerol. You need to know that. Glycerol is the backbone of making triglycerides. So with a triglyceride, you're just going to have three fatty acids attached to where these hydroxyl groups are. And that's the most common type of dietary fat that we eat. That the glycerol is the backbone of triglycerides. Also, being a three-carbon molecule, remember that glucose and fructose are six-carbon molecules. So being a three-carbon molecule, it's sort of like half of a glucose. That's real important because when the liver wants to run gluconeogenesis, it can also use glycerols. So it can break down fat. So that's, that's worth knowing. That's going to come up again, too. That's going to be a real important thing, especially when somebody's eating a low-propane diet. They can break down their fatty acids. This is the theory of James Mitchell. He's this Ph.D. from Harvard who did a lot of research on. He came to the conclusion the best thing you can do is eat low-protein diets, low-protein, low-fat diets. So the benefit of low-protein, kind of like what Kempner fed his patients, because he says when you eat low-protein diets, there's a relative shortage of amino acids for gluconeogenesis in the liver, remaking glucose out of amino acids. So instead, the liver will have uh, triglycerides broken down. And the propane right here, propane trial, the glycerol, is used to make uh, carbohydrate equivalents for energy. All right, Whereas the, the fatty acids 
in this context are sent to brown fat and burn for heat. So they're sort of wasted, but that makes you lose weight. So that's why, uh, and, and Kempner, by the way, had a whole bunch of patients lose over, lose over 100 pounds of weight. Okay, so when you have four carbons, just with hydrogens, that's butane. And that's super important too, because if you make this into, well, you could just call it butanol if you add a hydroxyl group to it, but you're gonna make this into a, you put a carboxylic acid on there. I'm gonna explain what all these things mean in just a moment. You make this into butyrate. So that's the, the four carbon skeleton used to make butyrate, the most important short chain fatty acid for maintaining your gut lining, okay? And all these things have pretty logical names, pentane. So like pen means five, okay? So there's five carbon version of it, okay? Oh, you need to know when you just have a CH2 group, I forgot to mention that. A CH2 group is a uh, methylene bridge. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Okay. Um, glycerol is also the backbone for making your phospholipids. We're going to explain all that in a moment here. Um, okay, fatty acids, when, when you call it an acid, then there's a carboxylic acid in it. Okay, and the carboxylic acid means you have a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen, and then it's also attached to a hydroxyl group. Okay, this hydrogen can come off and bind with other elements, so a compound that can donate a hydrogen is called an acid. <clears throat> and this is a very classic appearance. Um, there's a guy named Nick Lane, pretty smart guy about chemistry and original life chemistry. Don't get me wrong, James Tour is a lot smarter, but Nick Lane's still good. And he basically said, when you study biochemistry, you come to the conclusion that God loves carboxylic acids because they're all over the place. All the fatty acids are carboxylic acids and tons of the metabolites for routine metabolism are carboxylic acids, like in Krebs cycle, for example, like in um, glycolysis as well. So anyways, so you need to know this. Carbon, double bonded to oxygen with a hydroxyl group on it, that's a carboxylic acid, all right? Um, so here's with two carbons, you would call it ethanoic acid, but once you deprotonate it, like you donate that hydrogen, then you would call it, um, you could also call it acetate. So acetic acid or vinegar is also this two carbon acid, but the point I'm making is once you donate the hydrogen, it's sort of like the conjugate base, but you're just going to call it the eight, A-T-E, because you're going to see that all the time. So with a three carbon uh, carboxylic acid, it's propanoic acid or propionic acid, um, but the one you really want to know is this one, butanoic acid, Butyric acid here with the hydroxyl group, if you donate that protein, it becomes butyrate. You're going to hear butyrate all the time because that's like two-thirds of the energy for the colon lining cells to make their tight junctions. That's super important. So dietary fiber by the good bacteria is converted into this butyr butyric acid or butyrate. Usually it's easy to say butyrate than say butyric acid. So the butyrate then is used to maintain the tight junctions, okay? Because all this production also acidifies the colon, which means it lowers the colon pH. And that's also helpful too, because it helps prevent the primary bile salts from being converted into secondary bile salts. So what I'm saying is this normal acidification of the contents of the colon has a protective effect to reduce the amount of carcinogenic secondary bile salts as well, okay? Um, and the butyrate, the fiber is feeding the good gut bacteria. The whole thing is all good that you get from eating the fiber, okay? It also causes the increased mucin production from the colonocytes, the lining cells of the colon, okay? The gut is called the enteric tract, so the lining cells are enterocytes. Most of this material, I'm gonna go over it again, um, sort of for those of you who it's new to, I'm introducing the, the vocabulary to you. So when you hear these terms, you know, used in context a little later, it's gonna make more sense. So the dietary fibers converted into short chain fatty acids, SCFA is the typical abbreviation. So the uh, two carbon acetate, that's gonna go by the portal vein to the liver and it can be used to make fatty acids. The three carbon propionate is also gonna travel by the portal vein, just connects the gut to the liver and that's gonna be used to make you know odd number of carbon uh, fatty acids in the body, okay? And people really don't need much fat. You know, why can a person live off potatoes that are only 1% fat or rice or sweet potatoes? And the reason is because the fiber provides any additional fat that's necessary. And there's a little bit of omega-3s and omega-6s mixed in there in the perfect delivery package. So we get whatever we need of those two. Okay. Oh, another thing is when you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, that's called a carbonyl group. Okay. That's going to come up a lot. Carboxylic acids, they end in the suffix ic. So propanoic acid, you know, 
um, acetic acid, ethanoic acid. That just means you got a carboxylic acid on the butyric acid, butanoic acid. They're both a way to name the same thing for our purposes. Okay. So like I was saying, the gut bacteria, the good gut bacteria, convert dietary fiber into butyrate. The gut lining cells and pterocytes use the butyrate to make tight junctions. So here's a typical long chain fatty acid. You know, it's got 16 carbons. The most common um, saturated fat in our human body is palmitic acid. They use Initially they got it from palm oil, that's why it has the palm name, but it's real common in animals. It's the most common thing in humans. Palmitic acid, C16. So what this nomenclature means is there's 16 carbons and zero double bonds. Okay. To be saturated means to be saturated with hydrogens, which is another way of saying there's no double bonds. By saturated, I mean there's as many hydrogens as possible on the tail of this fatty acid. So because it's a fatty acid, it has to have a carboxylic acid at one end. All right, But then the rest of it is all going to be just carbons and hydrogens. The, um, this part right here, the carboxylic acid, is polar. You've got a different electronegativity, desire to grab electrons on the carbon versus the oxygen. Oxygen is much more aggressive to want to grab electrons, okay? And because of that, it'll have a charge on it, and that makes it soluble in water. The remainder of the, of the saturated fat is just carbons and hydrogens, and that's hydrophobic because the carbon and the hydrogen have a very similar electronegativity. That means desire to grab electrons, you know. So for carbon, it's like 2.5 is 2.1 for hydrogen. So because it's so similar, those are not soluble in water. That's why all fat kind of gloms together and oil gloms together away from the water if you, if you try to mix the two of them. Okay, um, the fat is what is called amphipathic, and that means like amphibian. An amphibian can live on water or land. And in the same sense, a fat has the carboxylic acid right here that's soluble in water but it then has the fatty acid tail that is not soluble in water. And this can give it detergent-like properties, meaning something that's soluble in both is typical of detergents and emulsifiers, meaning that they can interact with both phases. By both phases, I mean a water phase and a lipid phase. Because in general, those are two opposite things that stay separate. Um, that's going to come up again. Oh, the name, the nomenclature also, when you say philic, that means loving. You know, hydrophilic is water loving. Hydrophobic is water hating. Okay, now we're going to go in a little more detail of the nomenclature for fatty acids. Okay, so here's palmitic acid again. Like we said, most common saturated fat in the human body. The side at the end of the fatty acid tail is called the methyl end. Okay, you can also call it the omega end. Um, the side over here with the carboxylic acid it's also called the carbonyl end, you know, the acid end. Um, this carbon right here is the carbonyl carbon, you know, the one with the double bond to the oxygen. That's a carbonyl bond. This carbon right next to it is called the alpha carbon. This carbon right here is called the beta carbon. Okay. Um, later on, we'll talk about beta oxidation of fatty acids, and that'll be relevant. For our purposes, the most important thing to know is that the methyl end, that's where you count the, double, the number of carbons before you add a double bond to it. Uh, so that's going to come up a lot. So you have a carbon at the third carbon. I'll show you in a moment what it all means. Okay, so here's some different types of fat. So sat fat is just carbons and hydrogens. Typically we draw a skeleton form of it where we're, each little angle just means a carbon. We don't even draw the hydrogens because you know there's nothing else that could be there but a hydrogen. Okay, now here's a MUFA. MUFA means monounsaturated fatty acid. So mono means there's one unsaturation, meaning one double bond. So here's a double bond right here. You know, the classic MUFA is olive oil. Like olive oil just have one double bond. All right, now here is a PUFA. A PUFA means polyunsaturated. That means multiple double bonds. <clears throat> and you count them from the methyl end or the omega end. So this is to symbolize omega. So this is an 18 carbon. There's 18 carbons, so it's a C18 for 18 carbons. There's two double bonds. A pink thing right here is double bond or purple, whatever you want to call it. 
And so that's two double bonds. So it would be 18 carbons, C18 for 18 carbons, and then two for two double bonds. One right there and right there, okay? And then you can make an omega-6 and 9. So it's an omega, meaning the double bond at the 6 position and at the 9 position. <clears throat> In these fatty acids, when you've got more than one double bond, there'll be a skip carbon in between with no double bond attached to it. This carbon is called the methylene bridge carbon because it'll be a CH2. There's a second hydrogen on here that I haven't drawn. The relevance of the methylene bridge is this hydrogen is very vulnerable to being plucked off and this fatty acid can undergo a series of reactions called lipid peroxidation. And those, that's when it, the, it's basically when it goes rancid. And this can initiate a chain reaction that destroys cell membranes. It can be very destructive to cells. Okay, saturated fat has no double bonds and it's very stable, relatively inert. So saturated fat is stable, it's solid at room temperature. Uh, cheese, for example, contains a lot of sat fat. And you know if you have a pizza and it comes in at night all hot, you'll it'd be kind of melted, okay? But then the next day if it sits on the countertop overnight, it's all hard because the sat fat cools off and it becomes solid. Saturated fat is very atherogenic. There's all kinds of BS artists on the internet trying to tell you sat fat is not atherogenic. It was proven to be atherogenic back in the 1950s, and it's been confirmed by numerous studies, okay? So sat fat is highly atherogenic, and sat fat is the main fat in meat, okay? The old joke is when you eat cheese, you look like the animal it came from, okay? And a pizza looks the same outside you as it does inside you, meaning that a cheese pizza is a lot to a large extent what atherosclerosis looks like inside the, the body, okay, especially like in the abdominal aorta, you know, so not good. Oh, and by the way, olive oil is not a pure MUFA. Olive oil usually will contain about 14, 11 to 14 percent saturated fat. It'll also contain a significant amount of omega-6 fat. It's liquid at room temperature, but it'll thicken when chilled. Olive oil is not a health food. All that stuff about olive oil being good for you is a bunch of just, you know, industry-funded chump material. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, so here's the word for lipid peroxidation, and that's a major problem with PUFAs. That's why I'll never eat anything with oil in it. Okay. All profitable foods are surrounded by a bodyguard of lies, meaning industry-funded fake research. Most of the nutrition research nowadays is fake. Industry buys the journal, they buy the scientists, and they produce stuff to say their product is healthy. Okay? That's why you have to be use your brain and common sense to read the stuff to make sense of it. And scientists are poor. Okay, Scientists, they need money, and it's very hard for them to get grant money. Especially nowadays, it's harder than ever. So basically, they either have to kiss up to the the big food or big pharma company, or they go broke and they end up, you know, you know, you know, packing groceries at the grocery store or something. Okay, it's not, it's not easy for them to get money. All right, no funding means no publication, no job, no promotion. All right, and let me show you what I say. and that's also why you've heard me talk about it before. You have to have biblical Christian ethics, or you can't really have good science. Modern science is a big joke. Look, the healthcare industry hurts more people than it helps nowadays. And that's because it's based on profit, not on love or helping people. And until it changes its ethics, it's only going to keep getting worse. All right. And people who don't realize that, that's because they don't know very much. Believe me. I, I, I'm, I, I'm immersed in the healthcare world every day. And I've been since I was young, you know. Uh, so I, I'm pretty familiar with the healthcare world in great detail. My father is a doctor. I grew up around tons of doctors. And I've been in that world for, you know, since I was a little thing. Okay, here's the structure of a phospholipid. Um, you've got the glycerol backbone. There'll be three carbons in a row, like propane, propane triol, like an oxygen here, an oxygen here that's sort of esterized to, this, um, to these fatty acids and then bound to a phosphate over here. So for a phospholipid, phospho means phosphate, and then lipid is this um, glycerol backbone attached to a couple fatty acids. The relevance of this is this is also an amphipathic molecule, meaning that you have a hydrophobic or lipid uh, molecule in the hydrophobic part of the phospholipid bilayer. So here's a phospholipid bilayer, meaning a plasma membrane. So these are just fatty acid tails that are in the center. So those are hydrophobic. A polar molecule is not going to be able to get through there. And then the circular sort of purple circles, that's the uh, phosphate, and you'll have a polar hydrophilic group attached to it, head group. But these are polar. They have a charge on them, so those will 
be the outer surface. So the outer surface of a membrane, plasma membrane, is charged and the inner surface and hydrophilic, whereas the, and it interacts with an aqueous environment, like in the ECM extracellular matrix or in the cytoplasm of a cell, whereas the center of that membrane is hydrophobic. And this hydrophobic center of a membrane is a major barrier to things that the cell does not want coming in or going out. So that's how a cell maintains its integrity. That's how it maintains its sense of self, its uniqueness compared to the external environment. So this is a real important point, this basic idea of how uh, plasma membranes work. And there's a little fossil of a bilayer around the intracellular organelles, for example, around the mitochondria, around the endoplasmic reticulum, around the nucleus of the cell, okay? Oh, okay, I just drew a picture here uh, showing the olive tree. So the olive, you know, it's a part of history. The ancient Greeks, you know, the great book, uh, Odysseus was the hero of the Odyssey. You know, there was the Iliad and the Odyssey were kind of like what the Bible is to us, is what the Iliad and the Odyssey were to the ancient Greeks. And Odysseus is the hero of the Odyssey. It was where basically they've been victorious in Troy, and now he wants to come home to Ithaca and see his beloved wife, Penelope. And part of the story is that they had built their bed around an olive tree. And when he comes back, Penelope thinks it's him, but she wants to be darn sure so she asked him a question, and he knew that their bed had been built around an olive tree, and he could only know that having been her husband. And um, so anyways, the Greeks love olive oil, and I have some Greek friends. They're very nice, and they, you know, have conniptions when I criticize olive oil. But I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's not a health food, okay? All right, I'm going to show you a little more detail now about fatty acids. So here we're talking about the C18 series. So that's really the main things you're talking about with a fatty acid. How many carbons does it have? So C18 meaning it has 18 carbons. And then how many double bonds does it have? What is their location? All right, so steric acid is just the saturated fat version of C18. <clears throat> so you'll have 18 carbons. Again, here's the carboxylic acid, carbonyl carbon, alpha carbon, the beta carbon. All right, and then oleic acid is the... MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acid, and it's omega-9, meaning that the double bond is at the ninth carbon counting from the methyl M, the omega N. So it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You'd have a double bond here with olive oil, okay, with, um, yeah, with oleic acid specifically for the omega-9 uh, part of it, the MUFA part of it. All right, <clears throat> then you have an important... Uh, acid here, omega-6 fat, called linoleic acid. And you can remember linoleic acid, sort of two letters, L-A, and they stand for remind me that it has two double bonds. And it's a double bond, first of all, at the omega-6 position. That's its first double bond, so it's an omega-6 fat. And it's good to know that. That will come up more later. Um, and omega-6 fats are actually much more common in the human body than omega-3 fats. Um, it can be elongated and desaturated. I mean, elongated made longer, from 18 carbons to 20 carbons. And desaturated means that double bonds are added to it. So it starts out as a C18-2, 18, 18 carbon, two double bonds. And it'll become a arachidonic acid, 20 carbons. So it's two carbons added by the elongase. And desaturated, meaning two double bonds added by that enzyme. All right, and arachidonic acid is a precursor for some inflammatory uh, secondary mediators, prostaglandins and leukotrienes. So that will come up a lot. Arachidonic acid is an important fat. And in general, we think of these omega-6 fats as being pro-inflammatory. They actually do more than that, and they actually do some good things too. But in general, the simplified view of them is to think of them as inflammatory. But they actually serve a very useful purpose in mitochondria, which we'll talk about a little later. Okay, um, and the thing to know too is the... The original essential fats, there's only two essential fats. There's linoleic acid right here, C18-2, and there's alpha linolenic acid. This is C18-3. Those are the only ones that are essential. All the other stuff that they can be made into, like the fish oil, EPA, and DHA, those are derivatives. So the POs are uh, PEO, parent essential oils, and that just means that is the true essential uh, fat omega-6 linoleic acid, and that gets made into arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid itself is a DEO, derivative essential oil. It is not essential. You don't need to eat arachidonic acid. If you eat this linolenic acid, linoleic acid, you'll get all the omega-6s you could ever want. If you eat this 
omega-3, source C18-3, ALA, alpha-linolenic acid, the, you know, got to remember that N in there. Um, then you can make all the longer EPA or DHA that you could want. And in my opinion, I think it's stupid to take these unless you have some special health condition like you have refractory autoimmune disease because these have a high tendency to go rancid. That's why these things are stored in the refrigerator because that decreases the likelihood of rancidity in a radio-opaque container, which also decreases the likelihood of rancidity. But the fact that they can react so readily, what do you think happens when you take them from room temperature and you put them in your body, you know, 98.6 degrees, okay, they can go rancid pretty fast. When you eat them in a plant, they're kind of packaged in a safe way until you absorb them. Okay, but th that's a useful point to know. The only essential fatty acids are these two, C18-2, linoleic acid, and ALA, C18-3. Okay, those are the PEOs, parent essentials, versus these are all DEOs, derivative essential oil, derivative essential oil, EPA and DHA. And look how what a monster DHA is. It's got C18, C22, 22 carbons, and six double bonds. The more double bonds you have, the more likely that PUFA is going to become, undergo lipid peroxidation, have bad things happen to it, okay? All right, we went through that stuff. Okay, now we're going to go through a little bit about uh, lipid peroxidation. So for lipid peroxidation, the vulnerable carbon is the one in between the double bond. So this is again called the methylene bridge. This hydrogen is drawn in red because it's very vulnerable to being plucked off. And in the presence of oxygen, <clears throat> the oxygen will then bind to the methylene bridge carbon. And this is called the peroxide where you have the two oxygens next to each other, single bonded right there. And these can initiate a chain reaction that just keeps going around stealing electrons from other molecules. In general, that's one definition of a pathogen, something that steals electrons. And this can initiate a whole chain reaction that destroys plasma membranes. All right, and there's even a type of cell death in the context of large amount of free iron called ferroptosis. So what I'm basically saying is these PUFAs are kind of dangerous. At least when you get it, when you eat plants, you get them in the small amounts and they're packaged in a safe way so your gut absorbs them versus, you know, this supplementary oil container, they're often quite a bit spoiled before you even eat them, you know, that lousy, fishy smell. Um, I don't recommend any of that stuff, okay? Uh, so, like I said, too, the, the fish oil is worse than if you have the C18-3s, but I still would avoid them. Okay, so this is a real important point. Methylene bridge undergoes lipid peroxidation, initiates chain reactions that can destroy membranes. And your antioxidants help prevent this, okay? And the more double bonds, the worse it is. So it's much worse with PUFAs than with MUFAs. And it's much worse with long chain PUFAs because they got more double bonds in them. And the peroxide is a free radical. Okay, a little bit about how does oxygen travel across cell membranes. The old explanation was oxygen just sort of seems to get across on its own by diffusion. And then the next explanation that was thought to be the major thing <clears throat> was that oxygen would sort of interact with the methylene bridge carbon and then <clears throat> work its way across methylene bridge type carbons in particular and then get into the cytoplasm. But then it's been shown by more recent research that the main way oxygen gets into a cell, gets across the plasma membrane, is it travels through protein carriers in the membrane, the plasma membrane and the inner organelle membranes like the mitochondria. And that's over 90%, probably significantly more than that, but we don't know the specific transporters. The aquaporin protein transporter that's related to water transport is involved in this, and also the rhesus one, which is associated with the antigens on red blood cell surfaces. But the important point of all this slide, why am I showing you this, is to know that it appears to primarily be mediated by plasma membrane proteins to transport the oxygen. That's relevant because it used to be thought, you know, for a while that maybe or maybe six facts are the key and that was the reason why some people also recommended omega-6 fats, but it appears that that's not the case now. Okay, um, and the other thing I thought was really funny was I spent a long time <clears throat> trying to figure out why, how oxygen gets across the plasma membrane, and there's almost nothing on it. I had to search and search and search to find three decent papers on the subject, and that's kind of my point about science and research in general. Unless something is profitable, almost zero money goes into funding it. 
And again, that's why I said you want to have good science and you should be Christian ethics because if you say, I want to help mankind, I want to do what is right for mankind, regardless of the profit, then you would study all these things. But if all you want to do, I can tell you the vast majority of, of research, so-called medical research, is people trying to win the lottery, come up with the next profitable drug. And that's why they spend billions of dollars and fund nothing, zero. Look at so-called Alzheimer's, a joke of a diagnosis. And they've been coming up with bogus medicines that don't work and hurt the patients for decades and decades and decades. That's also why most cancer research is a big joke. These poison toxic drugs that don't help patients at all. And nobody cares about the other stuff because there's no money in it. And like I said, you have to love the proles if you're going to help the proles. And if you don't love the proles, you just end up poisoning them for profit or operating on them for profit. And that's just the way it is. Okay. Um, here's cardiolipin. I want to show you cardiolipin because, oh crap, sorry about that. I ran it too fast. All right, we'll get back to it. Where's my cardiolipin? Here we go. So cardiolipin is the most important um, phospholipid in the membranes, of, especially of the inner mitochondrial membrane. It kind of has a very unique structure. It's like two phospholipids stuck together with a bridging glycerol. Okay, so here would be like a typical phospholipid acid, like sort of a phosphatidic acid, if you will. Three carbons of the glycerol, then with their oxygen there, and it's sort of connected to a fatty acid, all right, and then to a phosphate. But instead of this just being a phospholipid standing on its own, they're now connected by a glycerol molecule to another phospholipid, okay? And this has the same, these are like mirror images, okay? But the really interesting thing about this is the linoleic acid, C18-2, the omega-6, Omega-6, remember that, it's an omega-6. That's what I mean by people think, oh, omega-3s are so great and omega-6 suck, they're just inflammatory pieces of crap. No, they're very important for your inner mitochondrial membranes. And that's why in this one study, I think the author's name was White, W-H-Y-T-E, that Pritikin had quoted, they fed patients only point, this is a controlled diet, only point, you know, like 75% omega-6, no omega-3s at all. And the patients did really well with an incredibly low amount of fat. Okay, so this is good to know. Cardiolipin is the key phospholipid of the inner mitochondrial membrane, and it has a bunch of omega-6s, all omega-6s. Okay, that's important, because if you try to change this, it messes things up. Oh, and this guy, Brian Peskin, he's a pretty interesting guy. He did some research. He's an engineer mostly by background, but he did some research on omega-3 fats and omega-6 fats. And he's actually the guy I think who coined the term the parent essential oil for omega-3s. And so what's interesting is he points out that if you give a person too much DHA, like they're taking DHA supplements, um, it will replace some of the linoleic acid and cardiolipin. There are a couple papers on this. I was kind of surprised finding this. I found it pretty quick. Then that will damage the mitochondria. So what am I saying? This is a big deal. What I'm saying here, this is actually a really big deal. This is an AO, academic orgasm here, that DHA supplements appear to be toxic to mitochondria. That's a big deal. So um, I would not take DHA supplements, all right? I mean, there could be a special circumstance when you've got a refractory autoimmune disease, and they might be helpful in that special, special case. But for a regular person, I think it'd be stupid to take this stuff. All right, um, and I know one person said, oh, well, isn't it good to help prevent dementia? I don't believe that. There's like one tiny, really minor paper, weak evidence in my opinion, suggesting a benefit. And there's a whole bunch showing no benefit. And there's a lot of reason to believe it's quite harmful. Like I said, damaging the mitochondria. Anything bad to mitochondria, I would consider a brain toxin. All right, in addition, there's increased immune suppression. And there's increased risk of prostate cancer. This guy Brasky was big on the research papers about showing how omega-3s increase the risk of prostate cancer. And the omega-3 supplements are associated with weight gain. You know, the fat you eat, the fat you wear is a McDougal quote. They increase insulin resistance. All these things are associated with eventual worsening hyperlipidemia. And they increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. Stupid, all right? Americans aren't dying from deficiencies. They're dying from excess of the bad stuff. Okay, so here's cardiolipin within a inner mitochondrial membrane. It'll be also attached to cytochrome C. And so when you damage the cardiolipins, you increase your risk of damaging cytochrome C, which is part of the whole apoptosis pathway. Uh, damage of cytochrome C can be associated with, you know, release from the inner membrane, this whole activation of a programmed cell death pathway, the apoptosis pathways, okay? 
And you also need these cardiolipins to make your tight curves in your mitochondrial, inner mitochondrial membrane and for binding to your mitochondrial protein popping complexes. The mitochondria is a really like an engineering masterpiece. It's a marvel. Okay, and it's made to be a certain way, and it's made for, you know, eat our plant-based diet, it, get what, it gets what it needs. You mess with that, you could mess it up, okay? So when you, have, when you damage the cardiolipin by lipid peroxidation, it can lose its grip on cytochrome C and initiate apoptosis. You'll often see this abbreviation, IMM, for inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, and it makes sense that if you have lipid peroxidation in the inner mitochondrial membrane, you're going to get reduced energy production. You need lots of ATP being made by your mitochondria, especially in your brain, to prevent all the problems that come with, you know, detoxify the supplements, toxic things like fluoride, toxic things like glyphosate and caffeine and all these other, the excess of glutamate transmission and synapses in your brain with excessive psychological stress and sleep deprivation. So you don't want mitochondria inhibitors and you don't want anything that's bad for your mitochondria, okay? With apoptosis, programmed cell death, the cell recycles its inner con uh, contents, and so you don't see anything on brain MRI. Um, you just see a, a regular paucity of cells when you look at it under a microscope. Okay, necrosis is when the cell dies real suddenly. Apoptosis is gradual cell death with recycling of the cell. Necrosis is sudden cell death. The plasma membrane breaks apart and spills its inner contents all over the adjacent area, and you get inflammation, edema. You can point to it on a brain MRI. That is where the stroke happened, right there. Um, versus apoptosis, you don't see anything, just stroke in a trophic brain. Okay, here's DHA, and part of the reason why I'm going all over, over all this is just to protect you from the stupidity of, you know, taking fish oil or eating fish. You know, fish is full of toxins, like mercury, PCBs, and all the estrogenic and other garbage that's poured into the seas and the rivers. You know, sadly, we, um, we use our, our oceans and our rivers as a sewer. Okay, and all kinds of junk is dumped in there. Okay, DHA, docosa hexanoic acid. So docosa means like 22 in Greek. Hexanoic I means like 20 in Greek, I think. Uh, hexanoic means six, and there's a carboxylic acid, all right? So this has got a lot of carbons. There's 22 carbons. Actually, it means 22, and then the hexa is for the six double bonds. So that's why it's a C- 22, 6 for six double bonds. And the first double bond is at the, you know, counting from the omega and the methyl end. One, two, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, and there's a double bond. Then there's a skip carbon, methylene bridge, then there's another double bond, okay? And I put these sort of in purple pink here for where all the methylene bridge carbons are. So what I'm saying is something like DHA that's got six double bonds in it, it has a whole bunch of these methylene bridge carbons. And these are all very much at risk for lipid peroxidation. So the more double bonds in that PUFA, the higher the risk of lipid peroxidation. So that's why I'm saying DHA is a dangerous molecule. It's, it's very, very, very highly prone to lipid peroxidation, rancidity, spoilage, and subsequent initiation of um, chain reactions, trashing membranes and stuff. That's why I would never take it as a supplement. Okay, and I already told you it increases your risk of prostate cancer, increases the risk of immune suppression, and animal studies increases the risk of, immune, of uh, metastatic cancer. Okay, and this is just something showing how much omega-6s are present in these common foods and how much omega-3s. And the point was just eating things like fruits, apples, bananas, blueberries, carrots, lettuce, spinach. You're getting a lot of omega-3s, all that you need. You don't need any more than that. You're getting plenty of omega-6s, okay? And yes, you can get some of these things from nuts, but you, with nuts you get all the fat as well and you get more advanced glycation end products. That's why I, I wouldn't eat any nuts. Salmon is, is a lousy food, 50-50 food, 50% protein, 50% fat. There's no carbohydrate in meats other than you know lactose and milk. So you're, usually you're getting way too much protein, way too much fat, more than you would want. But the reason I'm showing you this is just to realize you can get all the omega-3 and omega-6 easily from just eating plant foods. Okay, another thing is people say, well, you know, what about these studies showing that soy is good? A lot of times what they'll have done is they'll have taken meat and dairy out of the diet and replaced it with soy. And that's sort of a, a trick, almost like a straw man. You know, when you compete against a weak, obviously weak opponent, meat and dairy diets are very unhealthy. You can make the soy look good, make it look much better than it is. So soy is not as toxic as animal foods, but it's still not a health food. Okay. <clears throat> 
Soy is usually high in fat. I forget the exact percent, but I think it was like around 37% of the calories from fat. It's usually GMO, genetically modified. It's usually sprayed with glyphosate or glyphosate, whatever you want to call it, which is toxic. So neurotoxin, excitotoxin, and it's thought to substitute for glycine and proteins and damage them. There's a lady by the name of Stephanie Seneff. She's a PhD from MIT, a real bright lady. She wrote a whole book on uh, the problems of glyphosate called Toxic Legacy. She has a whole bunch of video lectures. You'll find her pretty easily on the internet. And she doesn't know that much about nutrition. Okay, I wouldn't take her advice on nutrition, but she knows a lot about glyphosate. The lady's a genius. Okay, so anyways, if you want to learn about that, that's where to go for that. Um, soy actually has some heme iron. It's often processed with hexane, another neurotoxin. It's associated with lowering male sperm counts. That's why they call guys who have a lot of soy, soy boys. Okay, it's feminizing. And I think that's a general trend in society, to feminize the males, make them infertile and weak and wimpy-minded, and to sort of masculinize the females. Mainly, I think, with the goal with the women is to sterilize them. Okay. Um, and I also think this whole idea of you must, you know, get a graduate degree or you're a loser. And, you know, any f lady who stays home as a housewife and takes care of her kids is a, is a screw-up. But I would actually say, you know, the happiest women I've seen are the ones that have uh, a couple of kids and spend a lot of time with their kids. They love that, okay? That's the thing that makes a woman happy, it is in my experience, is having kids. Okay, um, and also there's an old joke that the higher a woman's academic IQ, the lower her um, biological IQ, the more likely she keeps on going for a PhD, postdoc, residency, fellowship, you know, the less likely is she is to ever to have a kid. Good time to have a kid if you're interested in graduate degrees as a woman is have the kid while you're in school, in graduate school, because there's usually lots of trainees around to take up the work and you can make it up later. <laughs> Uh, like for a medical doctor, great time to have a kid, I think, is in residency because there's tons of other residents around to take the call. You can even take a year off and come back. I've known docs who've done that and been happy with that. Okay, so now I'm showing you another one of these seesaw things. And this is the balance between the nut promoters also play a straw game with nuts. They'll get rid of some really unhealthy food in the diet, you know, compare it with the sad diet and fat, sedentary people, low socioeconomic status people that are really unhealthy. And then they'll have the yuppies, you know, really health conscious exercisers, otherwise healthy eaters eating the nuts, and they make the nuts look good. Tons of money, billions of dollars goes into funding these profitable foods to make them look good, okay? I recommend avoiding nuts, kind of like the old Esselstyn opinion. You know, you tell people that they can eat nuts, they'll eat tons of them, and it'll have a negative effect on their atherosclerosis. <clears throat> okay, we talked about how starch is a polymer of glucose wrapped in fiber. And it's the healthiest food because um, it's low caloric density. It stretches your stomach uh, with relatively few calories. That provides early satisfaction of hunger, stretching the stomach. And then when it goes to your small intestine, the enzymes, digestive enzymes, it takes time for them to separate the fiber from the glucose. So you get the slow release, release of glucose to be absorbed into the blood. And you keep your blood glucose relatively normal a prolonged amount of time. If you just eat sweets, like a sweetened drink, um, you'll spike your blood glucose initially, and then the pancreas overacts, drives it down rapidly. That causes rebound hypoglycemia. So starches includes foods like potatoes, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are probably the healthiest food in the world, low in fat, low in protein. Rice, quinoa, quinoa, some people pronounce it like that. Oatmeal, peas, lentils, garbanzos, all those are really healthy. All right. Um, <clears throat> Starch satisfies calories, your hunger with the fewest calories, and it keeps people skinny and healthy. And that's the most important thing I ever learned is people should eat starch. Okay, here's an example of a toxic aldehyde. I show this because this is one of the lipid peroxidation products from eating these omega-6 cooking oils. Okay, and it can occur also with omega-3s. But lipid peroxidation is <clears throat> it's a hydroxy because there's a hydroxyl group on there. Known as NON for nine, nine carbons. Ene for the double bond. Here's the, the double bond on it. So H and E is how it's typically abbreviated. Hydroxy nano. So a mac, uh, and it's an aldehyde. With an aldehyde, you have a carbonyl group like this, carbon double bonded to oxygen. But instead of having an OH group on here, you just have an H group. So aldehyde. <clears throat> this comes up a lot because it's a very toxic aldehyde. It does a lot of destruction to the cells in our body. Here's a paper reference about it. But I just, you just want to know this one because it's going to keep coming up. Just remember, HNE is a toxic aldehyde. That's what you need to know. Okay, HNE is also toxic to mitochondria. So what I'm saying is when you eat these omega-6 fats, 
you not only get lipoperoxidation to trash membranes, you generate toxic aldehydes like H and E, and they will damage the ATP synthase of the inner mitochondrial membrane for making ATP inside the mitochondria. So this is the outer mitochondrial membrane, OMM. Here's the inner mitochondrial membrane, IMM. These are the electron uh, carriers, and they're also proton pumps, pumping hydrogen protons into the space between the outer and inner mitochondrial membranes. And this gradient of protons, because you build up a concentration in the inter intramembranous space here, is used then to harvest by letting a proton come back through the ATP synthase, and the energy generated by that attaches a phosphate right here to AD for di adenosine diphosphate, gets a phosphate attached to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So it goes from having two phosphates to having three phosphates. And this is the currency of energy. This is like a $20 bill inside of a cell. It does most of the work, uh, the energy production work. And it all gets made in the mitochondria. So like I said, you're screwing up your mitochondria with these omega-6 fats, in part because of the lipid peroxidation and because of the hydroxynonanol byproduct of lipid peroxidation reactions, this toxic aldehyde damaging your ability of mitochondria to make ATP. The saturated fats will inhibit complex three, and that'll actually cause this whole thing to back up and it causes insulin resistance and diabetes. All right, but you, you get my point. You're not gonna win with fats. You're screwed with any of the fats. You eat sat fats, you're screwing up your mitochondrial membrane. You eat omega-6s, you're screwing up your mitochondrial membrane. You eat omega-3s, you end up with these as a delayed effect, but you get an early effect, earlier effect of immune suppression, um, increased risk of prostate cancer, um, obesity, insulin resistance, and um, immune suppression. They're all bad. That's what I mean by there's no good fats. All right, now this is getting a little fancy. We're gonna come back to this later. I'll just introduce you to it. This is the concept of heat shock proteins. So heat shock proteins are proteins that are increased, upregulated in the setting of heat. And some of them do pretty important things. So HSP stands for heat shock proteins. So heat shock protein 70, one of the things it does is it transports uh, defective proteins that are sort of used up and dysfunctional to the lysosome. Lysosome is the main organelle for recycling stuff inside of a cell. It's got very, very powerful enzymes, you know, to break up these proteins. So protease is an enzyme that breaks up proteins. It's called cathepsin. And the point I'm saying is in the setting of lipid peroxidation, when you generate H&E, hydroxynonanol, that toxic aldehyde, the hydroxynonanol will bind to these guys, these little green guys, and it will then cause them to become super attractive to this powerful enzyme called calpain protease. So cal as in calcium activated, pain as in painful consequences. Um, this combination of lipid peroxidation, for example, when there's too much cytoplasm calcium due to stimulants like caffeine, um, MSG, MFG, they also have excitotoxin stimulant effects on brain cells, on neurons, on the postsynaptic neurons, sleep deprivation, stress, all of these things increase the amount of calcium coming into the cell, as does having a cell phone, the EMF from that, holding that up next to your head. And then when you have this excess of, of cytoplasmic calcium, you increase calpain's activity, and if you simultaneously have H&E binding to HSP, hydroxynonanol, toxic aldehyde, binding to the heat shock protein right here, then the calpain will cut the heat shock protein, cleave it, and once it's cut, it no longer can do its job. It can't transport these proteins. And it also has a second function of maintaining the integrity of the lysosomal membrane. So what will happen is the lysosomal membrane will no longer be maintained. And this cathepsin enzyme will leak out of the lysosomes. And it will start digesting proteins in the cytoplasm. And that leads to apoptosis, programmed cell death. So what I'm basically saying here is your neurons, your brain cells, are gradually screwed. They're being damaged as a side effect of the heat shock proteins. That's why Tetsumori Yamashima, Japanese neuroscientist, was given the task, why are so many Japanese becoming demented? They started becoming demented after the 1980s when they were eating more oil, more westernization of their diet. Okay, so we'll come back to this in more detail. This is called the calpain cathepsin theory of neurodegeneration by Tetsumori Yamashima. Okay, pretty famous researcher in that area. Okay, so that's how you spell his name, if any of you are curious to look it up. Tetsumori Yamashima. Okay, I made an entire video dedicated to him and his work on my YouTube channel. <clears throat> and I go into this and much more on my videos. I got videos on all this stuff in more detail if you want to see them. Okay, the Tetsumori Yamashima also showed, he did a lot of experience where he's like injecting these things into monkeys and man, <laughs> not good. But he proved what, you know, appears to be happening in humans too. 
you're destroying pancreatic beta cells, okay? So it predisposes to diabetes, and I think this is a mechanism of getting type 1.5. We typically think of diabetes type 1 as a young child, especially associated with dairy, damage to the pancreatic beta cells due to autoimmune disease, you know, molecular mimicry, cross-reactivity. I talked about that with my leaky gut stuff. I'll go into the more detail on this later. And then type 2 diabetes is typical older person like you know American after 30 years of age are getting fatter and fatter and they're having more and more insulin resistance from their high fat diets but 1.5 is a little bit of kind of a combination of type 1 features type 2 features and I think this is related to it this H&E okay so here's some of the papers like here's one of Yamashima's papers so implication of the cooking oil peroxidation product hydroxynonol that toxic aldehyde for Alzheimer's is just say for dementia so here's, here's his name, Tetsumori Yamashima. And here's what his hypothesis is called, the calpane cathepsin hypothesis. And like I said, calpane is cleaving HSP-70, heat shock protein 70, okay? And he also points out the amyloid cascade hypothesis is really weak, okay? It's, it's a minor late issue in Alzheimer, so-called Alzheimer's dementia. Alzheimer's is a bullshit diagnosis, okay? And so here's what even he says. We suggest that beta amyloid is not a culprit in Alzheimer's disease, but merely a byproduct of autophagy lysosomal failure resulting from hydroxynonanol-induced uh, damage to heat shock protein 70. Okay, so what he's basically saying is the toxic aldehydes from the lipid peroxidation from eating these PUFA acids is what he believes the main thing causing dementia, according to his theory, all right? Um, and he thinks the whole beta amyloid thing is exaggerated. The guy has devoted his life to research in dementia, and he's a brilliant guy. Okay, he also did a lot of research on alcohol. And there's some Asian persons who are more sensitive to alcohol. They get flushing from just drinking relatively small amounts of alcohol. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Those same patient people are at increased risk for dementia if they're eating oils in their diet. So alcohol, when you first ingest it, it's also called alcohol. So remember, an ethane is two carbons. So ethanol is two carbons with a hydroxyl group on it, an alcohol group on it. Okay, alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme converts it to ethanol, and that means you have a, <clears throat> a hydrogen. So you have a carbonyl group, carbon double bonded to oxygen, and then there's a hydrogen here, so that's an aldehyde. And this is called acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde. And then that undergoes another reaction through acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, usually abbreviated ALDH. Whenever you see DH, that usually means dehydrogenase. So ADH is dehydrogenase, alcohol dehydrogenase, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Okay, so anyways, that makes acetic acid, or all like vinegar, ethanoic acid, all right? Okay, and that reaction is irreversible. And this is how alcohol is metabolized in the body. Okay, so here's the point. When you drink larger amounts of alcohol, you kind of overwhelm the liver cell's capacity to detoxify it. So typically the alcohol, first step to ethanol, acetaldehyde, that goes into the mitochondria, gets made into acetic acid or ethanoic acid. That's what usually happens. But the larger amount of alcohol, the more that ends up going through what are called microsomes, sort of like the endoplasmic reticulum in liver cells and they undergo a different enzyme. It's, it's catalyzed by something called cytochrome P450, uh, CYP2E1. And it's, it's a bit, for, to make a long story short, you're making more of these acetaldehydes, but the problem with this reaction is the cofactors generate lipid peroxidation products, and this can lead to lipid peroxidation of membranes and toxic aldehydes. So this is one of the ways that alcohol can be very damaging. Um, and some people that don't have that aren't that have a deficiency of their acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, like some of these Japanese people with Flushing syndrome, they generate more of these um, reactive oxygen species and have more oxidative stress, more lipid peroxidation. Um, and so Yamashima figured out those same people who get Asians who get that Flushing syndrome, and it's a lot of them. I forget the exact percentage, but it's real high. They're more at risk to get uh, dementia from these side effects from omega-6 cooking oils or from drinking alcohol. Alcohol is always a neurotoxin, but it's especially bad in these persons. Those old stories about drinking one or two drinks a day being good for you are not true. Alcohol is always bad for you. Um, my advice is don't ever drink any alcohol at all. The last time I had any alcohol was when I was dating my wife a million years ago. She told me I had to have a beer when I met some one of her relatives. Otherwise, they would think I was like crazy or weird or something. <laughs> Um, so my advice, don't drink any. I've seen alcoholic brains. Their brains look terrible. They're like pickled brains. Okay. Um, 
They're atrophic and shrunken, and they become demented and stupid at a young age. All right, whenever I see a shrunken brain in a young adult, I usually think it's because they're an alcoholic. That's the most common thing. There's other things that can do it, but I'll see 40-year-olds whose brains look like 80-year-olds because they're alcoholics, okay? All right, and then I got more text here. I'm not going to go through all of the text in detail. I'll just hit a couple key points, perhaps. Like I said, there's no good dietary fats. Just eating low-fat plant foods, you get all that you need. I joke that olive oil, calling it extra virgin olive oil, it's all hype. Like they're trying to say, you know, you're you're going to get, you know, betrothed to an arranged marriage to a bride. Extra virgin olive oil. They just hype it up. And the whole Mediterranean diet is a big bogus concept. Like I said earlier, I call it the Antichrist diet because it makes people sick. It promises to save them, but it makes them sick. They almost don't forbid everything, anything. They allow you to eat fish, olive oil, wine, cheese, eggs, chicken, and other metabolic poisons. It's a high-fat diet, typically. Okay, um, olive oil also contributes to um, some of this blood sludging effect, decrease uh, flow-mediated dilation. Um, and then in my book, I'll often have like these Socratic dialogues, you know, like platonic dialogues where different characters are debating each other. And I'll often have these characters of SR for skeptical reader, VP for vegan prophet. Um, and then I'll go by here with the abbreviation skeptical reader. Okay, and then PMP will be plant man Prometheus. Okay, so what I'm saying is all these companies, they set up these short-term studies to make whatever food they're trying to sell look good. Um, and they're bogus studies. All right. Robert Vogel guy he does all the tourniquet tests, pretty famous cardiologist, and he showed there were problems with olive oil. Um, and there's been other studies to show problems with olive oil. You don't want to eat it. Um, Claper has a good lecture on olive oil on the internet. Let's see, what else? You don't need oils for cooking. I just boil all my starches. You don't need olive oil for that. You don't need to put oil on your salad. Just eat it plain. You get used to it. Or, or it puts... I'll let you do whatever you want. But all I'm saying is you don't need. Some people like putting vinegar on this. I'll go ahead. I just eat it plain. I think that's the manly thing to do. Um, you get used to it, and I like it that way. Okay. And I like to not cook with any oils at all because then you don't slime all the cookware. Whenever you cook with oil, it ends up a big slimy thing, and you got to use a dishwasher. By not using oils for cooking, then you don't even need to have a dishwasher. Okay, and I say oils are the Achilles heel of philosophical vegans. I think eating oils are the big problem for why... People eating a diet, Indian diet have a lot of health problems, even though they're still quite often thin. I had mentioned a conversation I had with this Indian doctor friend of mine, pretty skinny guy, pretty energetic and active, and walks around a lot, making his rounds. And I didn't see him for a couple months, and then when I saw him again, I said, hey, what happened to you? Where have you been? He said, he, he said, I died, but I'm okay now. I go, what do you mean you died? He said, I had a heart attack, and I coded, but they success, successfully resuscitated me, and they put in a coronary artery stent. I said, I thought you were a vegetarian. Okay. And he said, he said, I am. And I said, well, it must be the oils. You put oil in your food. And he goes, yeah, you need that for cooking. I said, no, you don't. All oils are bad for health, including olive oil, coconut oil, and fish oil. So whenever I hear 100% vegan had coronary artery disease, it's usually because they're eating a lot of oils, okay? Um, and atherosclerosis worsens just as much from saturated fat, from MUFAs as saturated fat, uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, best results in the world of any doctor for treating coronary artery disease. 100% plant-based, no oils, no nuts, no caffeine. His results are about 40 times better than those obtained by, you know, an optimized version of the Mediterranean diet. You can see the Lyon study for that. And when you look closely at the data, it's obvious that any intelligent person would choose vegan diet over drug stents or surgery. Atherosclerosis is always diffuse, okay? And the only way you're going to fix that is with the vegan diet. The drugs don't work very well. Um, stents and surgeries don't increase longevity at all for the atherosclerotic treatment part, other than in the setting of an acute MI, like with the stent. In the healthcare world, it's astonishing how few people read. Like I said, 99.9% .9 of people choose drug stents and surgery treatments that never work over the vegan diet, something that almost always works. Okay, so it's like they always do the wrong thing. Okay, um, these are some references if you want to see them. Blankenhorn paper here. Uh, influence a diet on atherosclerotic plaques. The point was atherosclerotic plaques progressed eating a, a diet high in fat. MUFA is just as much as saturated fats. All fats make atherosclerosis worse. Here's another one in, in green monkeys. African green monkeys are thought to be quite a bit like humans. And the MUFAs, sat fat and PUFA, 
Um, compared with dietary MUFA and SATFAT, PUFA protects African green monkeys from coronary atherosclerosis. So in this one, they thought PUFAs weren't as bad as MUFAs or SATFATs, but they're all bad. Like I said, it's like competing. It's a straw man argument again. This one is what? Affects the dietary fat and postprandial activation of blood coagulation factor 7. Yeah, they'll increase a clotting factor in the blood. Not a good way to go. Here's Esselstyn's famous paper, A Way to Reverse Coronary Artery Disease, 2014. Okay, here's Caldwell Esselstyn's book. He's got, of course, lots of online lectures. Okay, um, like I said, they can be good in acute myocardial infarction. And in some settings, cardiac surgery can save lives, you know, a lot of bad valve disease. But for coronary artery disease, most people are just better off going low-fat vegan. Okay, um... You're still screwed. Some people say, what about grass-fed cattle? Well, the grass-fed cattle is a little bit better, but it's still going to be full of saturated fat. Um, how much fat is ideal for humans? I would say ideally, you know, less than 5%. But if you just eat a low-fat plant diet, you'll probably end up somewhere around 80-10-10, 80% carbohydrate, 10% protein, 10% fat. And that's a healthy diet. Kempner's diet was about 5% fat, okay, and only about 5% protein. His patients had incredible improvements in health. Okay, meat has tons of fat. You know, almost all meat is really high in fat. Even if they talk about their leanest meat, they might play some games, you know, and get it get it down to like 25 or 30 percent fat. Meat is high fat. Forget about it. Okay, I talked about nomenclature already. Let's see here. I'm going through this kind of quick because this is sort of like the text part of the chapter. I had the images at the beginning of the chapter, and then I included some extra text in case anybody wanted that. Um, but I don't think that is too necessary for our lecture. We talked about phospholipids, we talked about cardiolipin, we talked about lipid peroxidation. All right. Um, well, I got tons of lecture on, on the estrogens. Um, and also these fats can have emulsifier effects that can also be toxic to the gut lining. And the bile salts are toxic. You get more bile salts released by the liver when you're eating a higher fat diet because they help to emulsify the fats for digestion. So the more fat a person eats, the more bile gets secreted, and the more bile ends up in the colon, and the more it predisposes to forming secondary bile salts and increasing the colon cancer risk. Rural Africans who eat a plant-based diet hardly ever get colon cancer, whereas American African Americans get tons of colon cancer. Um, Nathan, Dennis Pritikin knew the stuff back in the 1960s, Nathan Pritikin in the 1970s, about how good an idea it is to minimize fat and increase dietary fiber. Okay. Um, well, that was just additional problems with me. Okay, so that's the end of this chapter. So the whole point of that chapter was just showing you that there are no good dietary fats. The little bit of fat you need, you get it just from the fiber in your plant foods and the tiny bit of omega-3s and omega-6s that are mixed in. So anyways, uh, I hope that was helpful to you.